it an amazing privilege if I can share the Word of God, and I take it with the deepest respect. And I was thinking about what to preach today. And January is a bit of an interesting month here at Hills because we are not usually in a sermon series, so we have a bit of a free hit. We can choose the topic we want to talk about. And you think it's easier, but I actually find it a lot harder because you just overthink it sometimes so much. But there's one topic that has been really resonating with me, I would say for years now. And this is the topic I chose to preach on today. And it is that our God is a consuming fire. Fire is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Like we love a bonfire on a Saturday evening in the cold winter days to sit around it and roast our marshmallows. We like the warmth that it gives. We like looking at the flames. There's lots of beauty to a fire. But fire has also something dangerous. Like we teach young children from the very beginning that they should respect fire. There's a dangerous element within it. And then we live in a country here in Australia where we experience bushfires. And in fact, we have families here in our congregation who lost their belongings in one of the latest bushfires. It's devastating. The Black Saturday bushfires in 2009 in Victoria has been the largest bushfires this country has experienced since colonization. Over 450,000 hectares of land were burned back then. 173 people lost their lives. Millions of animals lost their life. The fire was so hot that it had 1,000 degrees Celsius in the center of it. And it burned absolutely everything that came in its way. Steel structures were completely melted. And every single thing that was burnable was 100% consumed. So what does it mean when we talk about that our God is a consuming fire? Over the years, I had different conversations with people who probably prompted me to think a bit further in this area. One conversation I had was with a dear friend of mine who once believed in Jesus but walked away. And she said to me, Leona, I went to youth group and the whole faith, everything, or everything I experienced was based on emotions. It was always like a massive hype, but this God that seemed to be so woo at youth group did not seem present in my life at all. I couldn't find him in my day-to-day -day life. And it broke my heart, I felt really sad about it. And I wonder if anybody has ever told her how to journey with God and how to respect God. Another conversation I had was with a friend of mine who is a mum, and she's wrestling with this whole topic on how to, how to raise your children in the name of the Lord. And she said, surely there's something missing if all we are saying to our kids that our God is love. And I was thinking about it, and I was like, no, but it's true. God is love. And in actual fact, his very essence of his being is love. But a part of this love is his holiness. And a part of this holiness is this consuming fire. And then I was... Years ago, when I was in my late teenage years, I lived in Germany. I um, went to our church and we went through quite a big change in our church. We swapped the red songbook to the green songbook. <laughs> and it was a massive deal back then. It was big. It was like long conversations around it, people discussed it, all sorts. But finally, the decision was made. We get a new songbook and it had newer songs in it. And the songbook arrived and all the young adults were devastated because we couldn't even pick if the songs were new or not. We had no idea. So I felt quite crampy. And I went to my Oma, to my grandmother, and I talked with her about it. And I said, Oma, you know, like these songs don't really make me feel a certain way. Like I don't really, uh, something is missing. Oma disagreed with me because those songs carried her throughout the whole war. 
But then she looked at me and she said, Leona, I think you and I, we can, we can learn a lot from one another. I really believe that all the different generations, we can learn a lot from each other. I can learn from you that God can be my friend and that he's not just a consuming fire. But you can learn from me that God is not just your friend, but also a consuming fire. And I thought about this and it resonated with me all these years. And I was thinking about this God that I believed in and I was thinking about who is this God? Who is this God that I believe in? Do I make this God of heaven my matey mate, my mate? Just like a friend that I go down to have coffee with? And yes, absolutely, God is my friend. Jesus is my friend. And through Jesus, we can enter into this beautiful, intimate relationship with God, can we? It's so precious. But God is also a consuming fire. So what does that mean? God is a consuming fire, and that means that he consumes all the idols in your life to protect his name. The first time God describes himself as a consuming fire is in Deuteronomy 4, when he talks, when Moses talks to the people of Israel and he prepares the, those people to enter the promised land. And Moses says to these people and reminds them about that they should not worship any other gods but God, that they should not create any golden gods. And then Moses says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God is jealous for his people because he loves them so much, because he wants to be in relationship with them. He is jealous for the relationship that he will have with you because he wants you all, he wants all of you. He knows that he is the truth. He knows that he is the only one who can truly fulfill your heart. That nothing else will ever fulfill your heart but him. And he knows that. So our God is a jealous God and he deserves all of our attention. Dave talked about two weeks ago or three weeks ago um, when he preached on fasting. He addressed here that... that um, Fasting has to be sacrificial and that if we fast, you know, idols in our life, they don't actually just deserve a fast, they deserve a funeral. And I won't repeat a lot more to this, have a listen to the sermon, but it was a good one about idols in your life. But I do want to ask you the question, is there anything in your life that has a higher priority than God? Is there? Is it work? Is it your health? Is it money? Is it gaming? Is it sport? Your God is a jealous God. And he wants to protect his name. And he cannot share worship with something that is unholy because he is holy. A holy God cannot be put on the same level as anything that is unholy. This is why you cannot worship money and you can worship a holy God. And the Bible is very clear about it. This is why you cannot worship social media and you worship God at the same time. You can't do it. You can't put anything that is unholy on the same level as a holy God. And a good example of this is, we can see in the story of Elijah. And many of you may have heard this story. Elijah gathered the prophets on, on the crown of Mount Carmel and he challenged the people and he said to them the question which I loved. He said to them, how long do you want to live between these two different opinions? How long do you want to do it? How long do you want to worship Baal and how long do you, you want to worship alongside our God? What is happening here? And then he challenged them and then he said to them, all right, here's the deal. You built an altar and you put a bull on it and I will do the same. And then we call upon our gods and we ask him to send fire from heaven for this offering. And the God who will do it, he is the only true God. So the prophets did it. 
And they prayed all day and nothing happened. And then it was Elijah's turn. And Elijah asked them to take a trench around it and to pour water over the bull once, twice, three times. It was completely wet. And then Elijah prayed. And then it says in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And all the people saw it. They fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Elijah challenged the people and asked them the question, how long do you want to live between those two different opinions? And I think this is a very good question that you can ask yourself right now. Do you live your life between two different opinions? And if you do, make a choice. God is a consuming fire and that also means that he keeps us focused on Christ, our salvation. God has a salvation plan. He has this from the very beginning. He always had it. Right in the beginning, it says in, in the book of John, was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and he, Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was nothing was not anything made that was made. God's salvation plan is Jesus. God's salvation plan is Jesus. Jesus came, he lived, he died, he conquered death in order to reconcile us back with his God. This is God's salvation plan and God will do anything he can do to protect his salvation plan. Anything. And we can see this very early on already in the Old Testament. When just after Moses taught the Israelites not to, um, to, do, to, to create any golden calves, he said also to them um, that in the moment when they enter the new land and they were about to face nations that were a lot greater and mightier than they were, it says that he who will go before you as a consuming fire is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you. God, the consuming fire went before the Israelites and he made sure that his salvation plan will be done. Why? Because he promised them. Because he's absolutely sovereign over what is happening in this world. And he always will be. He always will be. So much of the Bible, of the New Testament points to Jesus. So much. And of the New Testament. And always will. Because this is God's salvation plan. And he will make sure that he will protect it. We need to understand that God's character will never change. We need to understand that his salvation plan will never change, that his purposes do not change, and that it will always and always be about the cross. So we have a choice to make. We can decide whether we want to live our life in a way that points to Jesus, that points to the salvation plan, or if you want to quench the spirit, it says in 1 Thessalonians which will be obvious in the way how we live our life and how we, in our actions and in our behavior and in all of it. But you have a choice. Can I also tell you something? God is sovereign. And the hard truth sometimes is, is that he actually does not need you. And he does not need me. He does not need me to work for him. He doesn't. His promise will be done. His salvation plan will be completed. He's sovereign over all of this. So he doesn't actually need you, but you know what? He wants you. He really wants you because he created you in his image and he loves you and he sends his son for you. And sometimes I feel like we hear this because we've heard it so often in our life that it doesn't actually sink in anymore. But God has done everything he could 
in and through Jesus to save you. Paul says in Philippians 2, 12 to 13, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to enact in order to fulfill his good purpose. Are you willing to let the consuming fire refine you in your life? Are you willing to live a life that will point to Jesus, that will point to his salvation plan? God is a consuming fire and that also means that he's present. Fire in the Bible often represents God's presence. In Leviticus, we can see how the Lord instructed the outside of the tabernacle. And then he said that the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. And it must not go out. Why? Because the Lord himself lit this fire. And it represented his presence and power. Light and guidance. There's more stories in the Bible where fire represents the presence of the Lord. Whilst Moses was looking after his flock, it says that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. We can see how in this story, the fire represented the presence of the Lord. Then fast forward to the New Testament. And John the Baptist said that one day Jesus will come and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Then forward to Pentecost, what happened there? The Spirit came in tongues of fire. It says, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they, the disciples, were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord's Spirit came upon the disciples. And later in the book of Acts, Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Here is this promise that you, if you give your life to Jesus, you will receive the gift of this consuming fire, the Holy Spirit in your life. And this gift will indwell you, will be a part of you, will be in you. So what does that mean? It means that you can know that the Lord's presence is constant in your life. He is always with you. It means that what was once the fire in front of the tabernacle, this burning, consuming fire is now living inside you, that you are now God's temple here on earth. If you have the Spirit of God in your life, He will give you a passion for His name. If you have the Spirit of God in your life, He will purify you to become more like Him. If you have the Spirit of God in your life, he will give you further revelations of who he is. And you will be able to speak the word of God boldly. It is a gift. What a promise that is. So God, the consuming fire, consumes the idols in your life to protect his name. He keeps us focused on Christ, our salvation, and he is a present God. So what does all of this 
has to do with us right now, right here. I believe we can find the answer in Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 20, 28 and 29, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reference and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. It means that we can trust in his kingdom because his kingdom cannot, it cannot be shaken. Because the Lord will always protect his name and the Lord will always protect his salvation plan. This is who he is. And this cannot be shaken. And you are invited. You are invited to worship him. You are invited to spend your life worshiping this God. Can I ask you, who is this God to you? Who is God to you? I believe we need to know both. We need to know that Jesus is our friend and that we can have a really, truly beautiful, intimate relationship with our God. But that we also need to know that God is a consuming fire and that we need to have our deepest respect for him. Are you in awe of God? Do you respect him? Do you love him? Do you believe that he is a good, good God? Bandy can come up. We often say that in this church that we want to see Jesus glorified, lives transformed and hope revealed. And we don't say this just because it's fun. We say this because we actually believe that by making disciples, we can be a tiny part of building his kingdom here on earth. And what a privilege is that. So let's teach our youth how to walk this walk of faith in their daily life. If you have teenagers in your family, teach them. Let's teach our children that God is love and in fact that his very essence is love. But that part of his love, that it also means that he's a bit jealous and that we need to respect him and that he needs to be your number one in your life. Let's learn from one another intergenerationally. Let's speak to each other. Let's gain insight. I miss that my Oma isn't walking on this earth anymore. I deeply miss her. But I believe we can learn so much from different generations, from each other. So let's be in conversation. God's holiness is the reason for Him being a consuming fire. He cannot and will not accept anything in His presence that is not holy. But for those who believe in Him, He says in Isaiah 43, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This is why Jesus had to die on the cross. This is the very reason why he had to die. Because God cannot accept anything unholy in his presence. He couldn't have accepted us. But on this moment on Calvary, on this very moment, Jesus took it all on him. And he can present us now in front of God as holy and as blameless. And this consuming fire now will not consume us anymore. But instead it will refine us. It will refine your life to become more and more like him. I believe the cross is the answer to it all. I truly do. So let's live this life here on earth that glorifies God and that will glorify his name. Let's live this life here on earth pointing to Jesus, our salvation plan. And let's live this life here on earth knowing 
that the Lord is present in our life every single moment. I pray, I really pray that you will never stop learning who your God is, that you will stay humble and teachable and that this fire would always refine you. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, we praise you, God. We thank you that you are God. Jesus, thank you that you came to this earth, Lord, to, to save us. Jesus, that you can present us now as holy and as blameless in front of your Father. Lord, that your flames of this consuming fire won't all consume us anymore, Lord, but instead will refine us because of the cross. Jesus, thank you that we can enter the throne room now of heaven with boldness, worshiping you, Lord, worshiping you in who you are. Lord, I, I, I truly believe that we can't even fathom who you are. Lord, but we pray and we ask that you would continuously reveal a bit more of yourself to us, Jesus. Teach us more who you are, Lord. Help us to live a life that is humbling, serving towards you. Help us, God, to just be glorifying your name and protecting your name in this world. Help us to live a life, Jesus, that points to you and points to the cross. Lord, we are all yours. Jesus, and we cannot wait to see how you establish your kingdom here on earth. And thank you that we can be a part of it, Lord. In your precious name.